Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for the invitation to come here. Um, I'm an economist, so my talk is going to be a little bit different. Um, most of my work is focused on the Arctic, where I work on quality of life, living conditions, and impacts of climate change. And today I'm going to talk to you about climate change, ethics, and Arctic human well-being, and I'm going to provide some reflections from research in Greenlandic coastal communities where I work together with my international colleagues. Actually, one of them is here, Aya. Uh, and we are working in an interdisciplinary way and in co-production with local residents. Uh, in my talk, I'm going to focus in on climate, but more um, specifically permafrost soar and Arctic human well-being. Um, when we talk about Arctic human well-being uh, within the research groups that I'm part of, uh, we look at it in a more holistic way. So it includes health and well-being, but it also includes cultural well-being, um, fate control, contact with nature, material well-being, and, and education. So it's very comprehensive. Uh, when we talk about climate, um, we are also talking about a social challenge. Uh, and that means that we must uh, consider ethics. We must, must consider um, equality and um, how outcomes uh, can be done in, in a just and fair way. Uh, that also means that in order to arrive at a just and equal outcome, um, risk management and adaptation strategies, they need to reflect um, the cultural context the social context. And this is why we need to co-produce the local communities and get their perspectives. So that very much explains sort of the way in which we work. So what I wanted to do today is also to introduce you to a conceptual framework that we have produced for studying risk from permafrost thaw, where scientists and local communities work together uh, to co-produce um, the key risks or understand the key risks and co-produce adaptation strategies. Uh, and then I wanted to talk to you about uh, what kind of major risks we have identified in co-production with local stakeholders in Disco Bay. Uh, and then at the end, I wanted to just touch a little bit on a conceptual framework we are starting to work on for devising indicators to help assess the effectiveness of adaptation strategies. So here um, is just briefly uh, the two areas in which I work on climate issues. There is a Disco Bay that I will mainly focus in on in my talk today, uh, where we are focusing in on uh, permafrost thaw. Uh, but I also have a case study in South Greenland, but, but these are different climate factors we are dealing with there, and where we are trying to um, identify what it is in life that people value, and that will then feed into creating an indicator framework for tracking impacts of uh, global change on local society. But back to uh, Disco Bay. So Disco Bay is where I'm involved in uh, this EU-funded project called Nunateriuk. Um, and we have a field site uh, in the Nordic area on the west coast of uh, Greenland at Iluliset and uh, Kukatsasuak. And the purpose here is to work in co-production with, with the locals to assess the impact of permafrost saw on the coastal system and, um, uh, and it is, it effect on availability and accessibility of resources, the stability of infrastructure, the growth of potential new economic activities, and pollution and health. A high proportion uh, of the Arctic population live along these permafrost coasts, and many of them derive uh, their livelihoods from uh, marine resources. And therefore, as climate is changing, it affects um, their, their livelihoods. Now, when we look at this permafrost coast, um, the physical aspects of it is pretty much similar across the Arctic. Uh, but because of differences in the historical, societal, and, and infrastructural context, um, the way in which permafrost um, affects uh, people differs uh, from place to place. Uh, and for that reason, we need 
to dive into the local areas to understand uh, the societal context and, and the impacts there and work in co-production uh, with locals, um, which also then, of course, enables us to, um, to gather uh, their perceptions of risks in those localities. So just to speak a little bit more about the approach, because that's really where the sort of ethical angle comes in. Um, because of the very complexity and multidimensional aspect of uh, climate change, and in this case, uh, thawing permafrost, uh, it makes very little sense, if any at all, um, to try and tackle that kind of science coming from just one discipline. So for that very basic reason, we must work in an interdisciplinary way. Uh, but we must also work in co-production with local communities because in order to understand the different aspects of the way in which permafrost thaw affects people, we need to look at both um, uh, scientific evidence, but we also need to understand local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, um, and traditional knowledge. Um, so that is the way in which we work. Um, these communities that we are working with, and we work with them th through different ways, I mean, we have focus groups, we have community meetings, we have one-on-one -on -one interviews, um, surveys, etc., and dialogue on, on the various <coughs> uh, challenges. These communities are what we would call vulnerable in the sense that um, there is scarcity of human and fiscal resources, there is a lack of critical infrastructure, there is often very high youth out-migration, high unemployment, um, housing shortages, etc. So all the different factors that brings together and creates a, a vulnerable setting. Because of this vulnerability, uh, and because of the scarcity of fiscal resources in these places, um, climate change and permafrost is not exactly the highest priority on the list. Um, social issues are um, the high suicide rates, the high um, social problems, the unemployment, etc. That is what, what, what gets more attention. So when we look at these communities, um, we already know from the get-go <laughs> that the resources to deal with the issues are limited. And what that means is that um, there are certain trade-offs. Uh, there are many priorities, but we have to, to um, realize that there, there are trade-offs, and what that means is that those people who are not part of the conversation, who are, who are vulnerable, and who, or who are not included um, may risk uh, being uh, left out of, of consideration when money is allocated. And so that can present uh, an ethical dilemma, uh, also be because um, many of the groups that we are working with are already socially or culturally marginalized. Um, so they tend to also experience risk differently or are more exposed to the risks of climate change because of their limited access uh, to resources. So here is the conceptual framework uh, that we have developed to study risk uh, from permafrost thaw. Um, it's a framework uh, that basically describes the process by which um, large scientific projects such as the Nunatariac project that I am working with in Disco Bay, how such a large project of interdisciplinary um, you know, scientists can work with locals and, and stakeholders and together um, arrive at the main, the main uh, risks from permafrost thaw and then devise um, adaptation and mitigation um, strategies to address those risk, risks. In order to arrive at a, at a just and equitable outcome, it is important that risk management and adaptation strategies reflect the cultural and societal context. Uh, 
In order for that to happen, we must work in this kind of co-production. And this particular framework is one that has tried to tease out what are, what are the processes, what are the steps for doing that. At the very corner or central part of this conceptual framework is a notion of the dual dimension of risk, which basically um, is a notion that recognizes that there are two components to risk. There is the physical, which is where we talk about matters of fact, or we talk about hazards, probabilities, and consequence. But then there's also the social, um, which is construct, socially constructed uh, based on, on cultural values and goals. And the only way in which we can understand that socially constructed aspect of risk, we must work with local communities. Uh, so this is kind of our door in a scientist to the communities where we engage and we find out what are the divergent views um, who perceive these and these risks as high or low. Um, so it is a matter of talking to people to identify what are the perceived, um, the perceived risk or the risk perceptions. So one piece of output uh, that we have arrived at, and this is just to have a little bit of health <laughs> on the agenda, is the impact on human well-being or on mental health. So our team worked together in Kukatasuak and Iluliset um, to gather data uh, in co-production with locals, but also via a survey um, on mental health and on people's self-rated health. And the, the sort of, in short, um, the results are that for many locals, permafrost saw does not present a direct risk to their mental well-being. There are challenges and worries and concerns that locals have, however, that relate to infrastructure, it relates to traditional culture, and the concern of maybe uh, the future will be one without the possibility to go dog slating, um, or it is could be about the future in terms of how is the government going to allocate these scarce funds to different possible adaptation strategies, um, and will there be enough money uh, to do the critical repairs or renovations regarding um, the infrastructure that is damaged by permafrost and the permafrost soil. The survey that was conducted on Kukatasuak Island, which is a predominantly indigenous uh, community, found that permafrost thaw is not significantly associated with self-rated well-being, quality of life, and satisfaction with life um, that describe the mental wellness of local people. Aside from this, we were having a range of different settings and dialogues the locals in the town of Iluliset uh, to talk to them about the different dimensions of human well-being and um, gathering data on um, to what extent they saw these different and prominent aspects of human well-being as being uh, impacted by thawing permafrost. And the results from this work, which is still in progress and still needs to be uh, published, is that in general, um, there are concerns regarding all of these elements of human well-being. Um, in our work as well, in um, having this uh, uh, collaboration and co-production with the local, locals, um, we have been able to identify a number of domains uh, for um, uh, key risks. So for example, there are risks to health and well-being, to infrastructure failure, to material well-being, to being in nature, to cultural heritage, to food and water security, to fake control, and to travel and transportation. Um, oops. Um, when we were in Iluliset on one of our more recent um, field trips there, 
uh, we were also uh, interviewing a number of people uh, about how they would rate um, their risk perceptions relative to these different key risk domains. So we asked a number of interviewees to rate um, on a scale from 1 to 10 their risk perceptions related to, for example, health and well-being and fate control and material well-being and so forth. And what came out in this is that there is a broad diversity in how people rate it and, and clearly um, how a people's perception of the impacts of permafrost and the risks associated with these impacts um, differ, of course, depending on you know, your role, your responsibility, <laughs> your place in, in society, and your access to resources. Um, so, for example, um, government, um, the Department of Finance, would rank um, the risk of permafrost uh, to material well-being rather high, as well as to infrastructure, um, just to give you an example. In these discussions, we were also um, talking to different departments and different entities, etc. And for example, we talked to um, a housing company that could uh, tell us about um, the impact um, in houses in the area, and, and many of them relate to, to health and well-being. Um, you know, there are sewage problems, there is mold, there is um, floors that are tilting, there are difficulties opening and closing doors and windows. And there was also accounts of one workplace in which um, uh, the door was, uh, the floor was uh, slanting so much that a, an employee was saying, I, I get dizzy in the morning when I get into work. Uh, and as a temporary kind of autonomous fix to this problem, uh, a cooler uh, had been placed underneath the floor to try and prevent further damage or, or sinking or tilting of the floor. And then you might ask, why don't they do more? Um, and it comes back to the problem of communities are vulnerable in these areas. The, the financial resources are simply not there uh, to um, address these problems that everybody can see. Um, they are scarce because there are social issues that mount much higher and the planning horizon tends to be very short. Um, so if these uh, communities, and this is what we hear, if they certainly have the technical expertise to deal with all of these uh, issues from permafrost but they don't have the financial resources. So this brings up these ethical uh, considerations in that um, trade-offs need to be made. Um, and this is where it is important that everybody's voice is being heard, that there is inclusiveness in the process um, so that those people who are already vulnerable um, or, or left out of the conversation somehow, um, that their situation does not get somehow exacerbated uh, by the way in which um, decisions regarding where to funnel uh, scarce resources is being made. Um, just for a moment, I just wanted to <laughs> look further south, but I come back to the north in one additional slide, be slide before I finish off today. Um, but in the south, uh, they also deal with, um, they also have problems of climate change. It's more about storms and melting sea ice. Um, it's not about permafrost. Uh, but I have a project uh, down in Guyalek in South Greenland where we are looking at um, devising value indicators. We are we want to know what it is people value in life, and that is going to feed into certain key research questions we have. I just wanted to touch upon it here, um, just to flag to you that 
And that these things that deal with human health and well-being, as you can see here from the list, in terms of human security, flourishing, belonging, respect, equality and rights, are things that, that people in these coastal communities are valuing. This kind of method or, or, or data can help feed into work uh, or conceptual framework for devising indicators to both um, track the societal impacts of permafrost thaw or other climate change or to assess the effectiveness of adaptation strategies that are applied. So that brings me back um, just finally here, um, the framework for monitoring and assessing impacts of permafrost thaw uh, in the case of uh, Disco Bay. Uh, here we are just starting now on the work uh, to conceptualize, first of all, and then later it becomes more practical, a framework for um, devising uh, indicators. And we are taking as a point of departure an, ex an existing um, Arctic social indicator framework that me and my colleagues um, um, developed um, several years ago um, that simply um, uh, where the framework is uh, the most prominent aspects of human well-being, namely, namely health and well-being, material well-being, education, fate control, contact with nature and cultural well-being. So it goes beyond the United Nations Human Development Index that only looks at three of these, but there are these additional components that deal with the culture and nature that are important to, to Northern people. Now, in order to adjust that or fit it into dealing not with human development per se, but, but the impacts of climate change, uh, we, would need, we need to uh, go back and listen to what our um, communities are saying about um, what is happening with the impact of, of um, soaring permafrost. So clearly, uh, we will need here to augment this uh, uh, framework and add the biophysical, so it's both arctic social and biophysical indicators and, and one additional uh, domain that, that, that we need to introduce is culture. Um, also, in addition, in order to think about uh, ethical consideration, it becomes important that we also allow these kind of frameworks um, for indicators that help assess effectiveness of adaptation uh, and mitigation to also be based on primary data collection when we measure indicators. Uh, because clearly, in order to be inclusive, we also need to measure, for example, um, contribution made to well-being from, from harvest, from the traditional sector. That requires primary data collection, and these prior frameworks that I've been part of have tried to avoid um, indicators or domains where primary data collection was needed, simply because the, the, the money and the time to go and collect that data does not exist. Uh, so if you, uh, if you produce a framework like that, it's likely not going to be used. Um, so if you want it to really be used, you know, we, we try to um, make it in a way that, that, um, that it's easy to measure indicators based on already published data. However, um, if we think about the, the, the ethical aspects of this, uh, we, in the North, we need to uh, find ways in which primary data can be collected for these, uh, these kind of frameworks. Then just uh, for the fun of it, I guess here towards the end, I, this is my second to last slide, um, I just wanted to um, ask that question of, are the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, can they be um, can they be uh, useful or relevant for devising such a, a framework um, of indicators uh, for the Arctic? Most of us who work in the Arctic, we know that the SDGs are not particularly suitable for the, for the Arctic environment. They certainly were not produced with the Arctic in mind. Um, so there are various things more specific to the Arctic that, that does not seem to be um, um, addressed. However, when we look at the SDGs, uh, we can uh, ourselves um, be inspired. Uh, there are certain elements that we have not 
been including, including into our frameworks, uh, such as, for example, uh, to uh, ensure availability um, and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all, or um, to uh, build resilient uh, infrastructure and promote inclusive, sustainable development. These would uh, be two examples uh, of uh, maybe SDDs that could help inform this work that lies ahead of us. Um, and then uh, just in summing up, um, I wanted to say here in conclusion that uh, vulnerable communities and uh, complexity of challenges increases the importance of um, interdisciplinary research and co-production of knowledge. And prominent aspects of human well-being in the Arctic are impacted by permafrost thaw. That is what we, our research is showing. Uh, ethical considerations are critical for just and equitable outcomes and to help strengthen adaptation to climate change. Without um, taking these things into consideration, um, it becomes difficult uh, to produce effective strategies. Further development of indicator frameworks and in dialogue with locals are needed for assessing societal impacts of climate change. So again, this is work that we are currently starting on. Um, the process has started, but we hope to be able to say more about it in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this talk. It's extremely important to develop metrics for, for things that you can actually then try to evaluate and measure. Are there uh, questions? We could have one question now, and remember there's a chance to mingle with the speakers over drinks at the end. So um, <laughs> there's also a chance for that. Is there a question now? Please feel free. OK, yes. Maybe this is a little provocative. I've been to Ilulissat and other places in Greenland several times. And when I'm there, I feel that maybe the main problem is the permafrost. You can't do anything up there. You don't have anything to live from because of the permafrost. <laughs> uh, I think, yeah, yeah, I think that, that was provocative. That, yeah, that was provocative. Um, I would say that is um, not what we hear from the locals. Uh, the locals in general describe a, a, the, the, a well-being, you know, despite the permafrost. And the uh, permafrost is not something that necessarily really in any major way uh, varies them. Um, most of the infrastructure and the built environment is on, uh, is on in non-permafrost areas. Um, so I'm, it, it, I know that in Ilulisset certainly uh, there are areas where, where there is a built environment as well. Um, and this is the area that we have been partly focusing in on. Um, what is happening now is that uh, some of the infrastructure that is being um, negatively impacted by permafrost and some of the housing um, that has been destroyed by it um, is being um, closed down and, and new is being built in non-permafrost areas. So there, there's still terrain there um, for, for, for actually um, building houses. Um, so it's not continuous permafrost uh, in that region. Thank you.